Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and we're here to talk about the Scriptures. And we would love to have you be part of our show by adding your questions and comments, sending us questions by email, by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com, or following us and participating with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now, today, we want to dedicate the show to addressing your email questions. Why? Because I just don't get enough time to answer them all, uh, either on the regular shows uh, and not at home. It's just uh, so much going on. Uh, I got sinners coming out of my ears, so we've got plenty to do. So, so what we'll do is uh, we'll try to get some of these. Uh, we'll get as many as we can week to week, but... You know, we just can't get to them all. So today we're going to take some time and respond to the questions we haven't had a chance to get to. Okay? So let's start off here a little bit. One is from Scott. Scott asks, Dear Father Mitch, whenever I ask God questions needing specific answers, for instance, about job offers, healing, or sufferings, I'm always met with silence. Never. Any answer? How does this lack of communication not contradict the teaching that God wants a personal relationship with us? How does this silence not contradict Jesus' teaching that he and the Father would dwell within us? What does Jesus mean by asking and it will be given, seek and you will find, etc.? Scott. Scott, you know, and this, this sounds like it's somewhat of a disappointment and somewhat painful for you. I understand that uh, because, you know, that's one of those things that has happened in the lives of most of us at different times. Now, I learned, uh, I'm going to just talk about my, some of my own experience. I don't know how much of this applies to you, but there are a couple things that, you know, I think we have to pay attention to. The first principle about this is we are sometimes very tempted to set the agenda for the conversation instead of letting our Lord set the agenda. Conversations have to be both ways. And very often we would like God to take care of things that we're interested in. We want to talk to him about things we're interested in. I've known lots of people like that over the years, and some of the people who know me might also comment that I've been that way, that tried, you know, it's a human failing at times. We try to set the conversation uh, tone and we want to dominate the conversation. And when we don't give the other person a chance to respond or to have it as a conversation that's going back and forth, oftentimes we withdraw because it becomes uninteresting. Now, one of the things that is important to keep in mind you may need to just sit with our Lord in quiet. Don't ask him about stuff right now. The silence may be a way of him trying to get your attention. That has been my experience. When I find our Lord is being silent, it's because I've been on the wrong tangent in the conversation and he wants me to sit and be still. As a matter of fact, you may want to take a look at the psalm that says, be still and know that I am God. I believe that's Psalm 47, 46 or 47. Um, that would be a, a good verse to pay attention to and just be still and let 
our Lord begin to inspire certain thoughts in you. Now, here's some of the stuff that's been in my experience. One, oftentimes I found that silence when I was not repenting of sin. And not just saying I'm sorry. Oftentimes I needed to look more and more deeply at my sin. It's Psalm 46. Psalm 46 and it's verse 10. Um, uh, that, uh, that would be very useful to say, uh, okay, Lord, uh, is there an, ask him, is there an area where I need repentance? And a lot of times he doesn't just want us to get to say we're sorry, but <clears throat> for us to look at what's going on in there. What's the dynamic behind the sin? And he wants us to address who we are at a deeper level than taking care of issues like jobs and sickness and other things. He wants us to go into the depths of who we are. And at times, we keep bringing stuff from me, up to him and we keep the relationship superficial. That may be part of the silence. Try looking at that aspect and see if that might not help a little bit. All right, then we have this. Uh, Dear Father Mitch, I believe in the Trinity, but I don't understand how Jesus doesn't know the time for the end of the world. He said only the Father knows. If they are all one and the same, wouldn't they know all know everything? Loretta. Okay, a couple things. Loretta. Um, the Father, Son, and Spirit are not one and the same. Okay, that's one thing. They are one in being. They're one God. And each infinitely shares the one divine nature. They, each one of them is absolutely infinite in, and has this one divine nature. But they're not the same. They are distinct persons. So that's why it's Jesus, our Lord, said the Father and I are one, not the Father and I am one. There was an old heresy called Sabellianism in which it taught that Jesus is the Father and the Son. It, it taught that they're one and the same. And that comes up every so often, sometimes even with visionaries. Um, you know, you have to be careful. So um, this <clears throat> is something that is not quite correct. They are one in being. That's the consubstantial part. They have the same substance, same divine nature. But they're distinct persons. Secondly, secondly, when the Son became flesh, there are a lot of aspects of that that are very important. One, uh, one of them is that the Lord respects us so deeply and loves us so deeply he became one of us. And it elevates human nature and he restores us to the divine image and likeness. That's all going on. But there's one other element. And this is found in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. In Philippians 2, it said, Jesus emptied himself. That self-emptying in the, uh, the incarnation, when he became flesh and became like one of us and even becoming a slave, even becoming a slave so that he would die on a cross, which was the punishment for slaves. If you've ever seen the movie Spartacus, you see that when the slaves are caught, they're crucified. And so this uh, self-emptying means that he empties himself even of that knowledge. In his human nature, he empties himself of that full knowledge. And it's not given to him in his human nature because, and this is a very important thing, it is not good to know the day of your death. I 
have pointed out a number of times over the years, there's one group of people who know the day of their death, one group of people in our society that know the day of their death. It's the people on death row. And knowing the day of your death is not a reward. It's a punishment. Having that hang over you, where you know the day you're going to die, is a punishment. And God in his mercy does not tell us the day of our death. He does not want us to know the day of the end of the world. Instead, and the point that our Lord makes when he says the angels don't know and the Son of Man doesn't know. And notice that's how he addresses himself as the Son of Man. God who has emptied himself of the glory of heaven in order to become the Son of Man. And he doesn't know and only the Father knows. And it'll be at the time the Father determines is the absolute perfect time. That's why we don't, we're not supposed to know. Uh, I've said to you again, (laughs) even more time, more often, that uh, knowing the end times is a management question and God is management. We're in sales. Our job, as Jesus says in those passages, because he says that a number of times in Mark 13, Matthew 24, uh, all these places he says that the the angels don't even know, and you don't know. Also in Acts chapter 1, right before he is sent, don't worry about it. You don't need to know the times and seasons. All of that is because our task is to always be ready. And not say, oh, I want the world to end. Jesus, just come now and take me away. I'm just sick and tired of this. It probably won't be when you're sick and tired of it. (laughs) Believe me, the Lord will make you work through the problems. And that will be very important for your own growth as it is for mine. But you don't know. So that's why our Lord wasn't given that. So let us know as well in our humanity. We should not know. Okay? That's a good reason. All right. Um, Let's start off uh, with another one here. Um, Father Paquin, I'm 56 years old. Ah, youngsters, eh? All right. And I have prayed to Mary and various saints for intercession my whole life. And I felt consolation. And had prayers answered. But my 20-year-old daughter won't pray to the Blessed Mother or the saints. She insinuates it is praying to a false god with the dictionary meaning of prayer to a deity. I've encountered other people that agree with her position. How do I respond to this and help people understand? I tried explaining in a session, but they argue that we should only pray to God. Mary, Import Deposit, Maryland. Well, Mary... What, here's how I would start that conversation. So you don't think you should pray to the saints. Well, that's too bad because I'm a Catholic. And as a Catholic, I am a Bible-believing Christian. And I believe what the Bible says about the intercession of the saints and angels. If you want to reject the Word of God, Go ahead and reject the Word of God. I will not reject the Word of God. I'm going to believe what my Bible tells me about this. First of all, take a look at the letter to the Hebrews. Let me get my Bible here. Uh, Just to make it fast, I'll hang on to a Bible in English. I got my Greek text over there, but in Hebrews chapter 12, we see that it says, um, let's see here, Hebrews 12, that um, for you have, uh, this is verse 22, 
You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to a, a judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. Notice, and pay attention to that now, it says you are to approach the angels, the church, the, the church is the firstborn enrolled in heaven, but they're not in heaven yet. God, the judge of all, Jesus, mediator of a new covenant. You approach his precious blood that is sprinkled for us to have our sins forgiven. So when you washed in the blood of the lamb, you approach that, right? But it also says you approach the spirits of the righteous ones who have been made perfect. These are no longer people on earth. These are the spirits who have been made perfect. They are in heaven. And notice how you approach them. When you approach the heavenly Jerusalem, you approach those saints. So the Bible says you're supposed to approach them. Now, if she doesn't like her Bible, that's up to her. But I'm going to believe this word of God. Now, what else do you do, though? In, if you take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, it says that the 24 elders, these are saints in heaven, right? And they are around the throne of God, and they all have bowls of incense, and the incense is the prayers of the saints. They are bringing our prayers. That's in the Bible. Now, if she doesn't like her Bible, that's up to her. But then we also see in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, that the angel takes a bowl, golden bowl of incense, which again are the prayers of the saints, and he puts them on the altar of incense in heaven. Now that's in the Bible, and I believe that Bible. I believe that word of God. And he puts the prayers of the saints so that the angels and the saints take our prayers. They're like nuggets of incense that smell beautiful. But when you put them on fire, it releases the aroma. And the idea is this, that our saint, our, excuse me, our prayers to God are beautiful. But the saints will take those nuggets of incense and release the sweet aroma at God's altar in heaven. Now, do you want that or not? So this is what Scripture says. Again, she may reject Scripture. I don't know. But I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to continue to seek the intercession of the saints. You may want to take a look at my book, uh, Mary, a Bible study for Catholics. Uh, excuse me, it's called Mary, uh, Mother, uh, Virgin, Mother, and Queen. That's it. Mary, Virgin, Mother, and Queen. You can get that in our catalog. I, at the end of it, I have an appendix going through all of those verses, lay it out, and you can challenge her to take a look at that if she dare. But if she wants to go along with what the Bible says and not what the tradition of men denies about the Bible, she needs to read that. And that's how I would portray it to her. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. Right, so we are still doing emails today, trying to catch up, and, and that's not a condiment you put on uh, french fries. So this is an email from Jackie, who says, Dear Father Mitch, would you please explain 
1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Destroying the body in what ways? And if we do that and the Lord destroys us, are we also destroyed eternally? Okay, first of all, keep in mind the context, the context here. Always, always look at the, the, the place where it's found. This is the end of a uh, discussion where he begins in verse 10. And he says, you know, according to the commission of God given to me, I'm a master workman. So he sees himself as laying a foundation, like a, a, a master architect, and that he is building up human beings to, um, uh, with the foundation that is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of our Christian life. And then you build upon it. And notice he's also dealing with um, the, why is he arguing about this? Because there was a Jewish convert from Alexandria named Apollos who had come to Corinth and was building upon that foundation. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but some people were saying, oh, oh, I like this Apollos better. I want to join the Apollos church. I don't want to be part of the Paul church. That was what, uh, well, yeah, but don't you remember Kephas, that is St. Peter, came through town? I want to be in the Peter church because he's the chief of the apostles. No. And this is false. He's against that. He said, look, I laid a foundation, Apollos built on it. And the guy who puts on top of the foundation doesn't contradict the foundation. And besides, it's one Christ. Now, what he wants people to focus on is not Apollos or Paul. He wants everybody to focus, what are you building with? Are you building your Christian life with gold, silver, stone, wood, hay, or straw? Because he goes on to say that if the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. He's talking here about... Uh, how on the day, the day of the Lord, that is, will disclose what you built with and it will be revealed by fire and fire will test it. Fire will burn up what is cheap junk, like wood, hay, and straw. So what are you building your Christian life on? Are you taking the best of your life and building on that and taking the best of the truth of the gospel and building your Christian life on that? Or are you just saying, well, I'll just sort of be a nice person and just sort of go along through life and schlep along? What, what are you doing? Because it will be tested by fire. And then he said, he comes to the point that you're saying, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Now, he's not just... He's, the temple, of course, refers to the body, but it's much more than that in this passage. In chapter 5, he speaks of the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit in a specific way. But here, it's your whole Christian life. What you do to build up your Christian life, that is a temple. And the purpose of your life is adoration of God, giving glory to God as in a temple. Now, he goes on to say if, uh, um, that you, you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and that temple you are. So this is where if you self-destruct by committing mortal sin, if you self-destruct that temple and desecrate it, then you are destroying yourself. But other people may also try to attra attack you. And they may try to get you to sin. Or they may say sinful things about you that are not true. We s pay attention 
to, we're, we're hearing lots and lots more about how falsehoods were said about some people in the public media because they didn't like them. And other times, the truth about somebody's bad behavior was hidden. In either case, they're destroying the temple of God. And this is something we have to be very careful about, that we don't do it, we don't participate in it, and we're very cautious. And we, res we respect the inherent dignity that each person is called to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly why the church has condemned racism. This was exactly the kind of reasoning used by Pope Paul III back in 1536 when he condemned the slave trade. You are trying to enslave people who have free will and reason and whom Christ has set free. St. John Chrysostom had said this back in the 4th century. This is consistent teaching of the church. Because we are created to be temples of the Holy Spirit, things like slavery, which, by the way, just like to point out, I was listened to a wonderful, wonderful, uh, and uh, heavily informed lecture about the sex trafficking that's going on, that the slave trade today is almost four times the size it was when we enslaved Africans. It's almost four times as many slaves today as were taken from Africa over 200, 300 years. This is grave evil. It attacks the dignity. That's why you don't look at pornography. You're looking at a lot of people who are slaves and you're attacking their dignity. You look at pornography, you are trying to destroy their temple. So that's what is going, what is going on in so many ways. And we have to say, no, I look at every person that passes me by, people who are living on the street and others, and murderers and thieves, and all, they're all meant to be temples of God. And my task is to help elevate their dignity so they know the Holy Spirit within them. And they worship God in everything they do and live out that dignity. All right, let's go to Casey. How, Father Mitch, how can Mary hear our prayers and how powerful are they to her? Casey, well, you know, I've, I don't know how powerful they are to her, but one of the great things is that Our Lady is in heaven. You know, she's been taken to her son and with very special privileges. And she and the rest of the saints. Remember how um, I, just a few minutes ago, I used that image from the book of Revelation that the saints in heaven have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's the image that you see in the book of Revelation. Now, I've not been to heaven. St. John had a vision of heaven. I never did. I'm just doing what I can to accept the grace of God to help so that he can get me there. But that's the image that we see in Scripture. And so our prayers come like these sweet-smelling nuggets of incense. And she's, <coughs> excuse me, she is able to take those prayers and set them before the Lord. She does not answer them. God answers them. That's true for all the saints. She can hear our petitions and present them to God, but he is the sovereign Lord that answers the prayers. And this is uh, where she places it before God. Just like, you know, I don't know uh, about you, I, I get a lot of people asking me for prayer. I'm always happy to do that. And, you know, this is such a great blessing. A lot of times I don't even know their real names. I know, oh, my friend's father is dying. Would you pray for him? Well, what's his name? I don't know. I said, well, God knows who it is. And Our Lady also entrusts our prayers to God 
And, you know, she doesn't have an infinite mind. God does. So he knows all the best ways to answer them. But she'll give petition. And that's, that's what she does. Although I love this line by Archbishop Sheen. He uh, used to uh, say that, you know, about people said, uh, oh, when they come to the judgment and they stand before Jesus, said, oh, yes, I've heard my mother speak of you often. Yeah, let's talk. That would be nice. Of course, depending on what she says. <laughs> All right. Um, this is from John in Sebring, Florida. Father Mitch, I'm a big fan of your TV program, scripture, and tradition of the Society of Jesus. I'm just curious, what drew you to the Maronite Rite? Were you raised in the Maronite? No, I was not raised Maronite. <laughs> I was raised Roman Rite. As a matter of fact, I often tell the Lebanese people in my parish, and when I go to other parishes in the eparchy, I'll tell them, I was born Polish, born again Lebanese. <laughs> And, but what, what happened was uh, when I was living in Dallas, Texas, I was not able to find a parish in which uh, I would be able to celebrate Sunday Mass. And so uh, one of my colleagues recommended that I uh, come to the Maronite parish. They, he said, the, parish, the pastor will probably let you join them there. So I went and he was delighted. The pastor there at the time uh, and then his successor, um, who is uh, Father Assad al-Basha uh, at uh, Our Lady of Lebanon Church in Louisville, Texas, uh, they were both from Lebanon, and both had been fairly re more recently from Lebanon. So their English was not as solid as it later became. Uh, they, you know, take, sometimes it takes years of immersion in a culture to learn you know, how to speak a language with the nuances. So they, uh, the, the pastor said, well, if you would preach in English, I'll preach in Arabic. So that's what we did. Uh, though <laughs> one time he had preached first in Arabic, then he made three points, and I said to the congregation, um, what Father was saying is this, bam, bam, bam. Secondly, he wants us to do this, bam, bam, bam. And thirdly, he wants us to do this. And Father was looking at me, and he said back, Abu Namich, now you are danger. You know too much Arabic. So, <laughs> but I kept on anyway. I learned the liturgy. And I already had studied Arabic. Yeah, I could speak it somewhat before I got there. And um, uh, studied it when I was teaching Hebrew. Uh, in Chicago, and I already had studied Aramaic. So, you know, I'm about the only gringo in town that knows enough Arabic and Aramaic to get into the church and help out. So that's what I do, and I still do that here as well in Birmingham. So if you ever get a chance to go, especially on the Feast of St. Marin, if anyone who goes to a Maronite church on the Feast of St. Marin, which is, I believe, in February, um, that you gain uh, and, and pray for the intentions of the Pope and with the normal circumstances, go to communion and confession within a week, as well as, um, you know, like say, the normal prayers for the Pope's intentions. Uh, you can get a plenary indul indulgence on that day. Uh, St. Mary's Feast Day on February 9th is a holy day of obligation in the Maronite Church. So I think in the Maronite Church, it might be on the 10th, and then the Latin Rite, it's the 9th. But check that out, and go to your local Maronite Church and, um, you know, get those in plenary indulgences. All right, we have another email here from Lamb. I wonder what they called his parents. At any rate, um, Father Mitch, is watching the live Eucharistic adoration on the TV or internet as efficacious as being in a church physically with the Blessed Sacrament exposed? You know, um, it's, it's not the same exactly as being present, but it, you're watching live. So you are in the Lord's presence. Now, I, I don't think you need to genuflect 
in front of your cell phone. I, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, uh, but to have the, you know, and th this is a great thing um, on the EWTN app and a number of other apps around the world, you can be at a live adoration that they'll have Eucharistic adoration going on live. And there is a sense of being present to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. This is so helpful for many of you who are homebound. Now, I don't know, see, you might, some of the homebound might be um, unfamiliar with computers, it might be uh, senior citizens who, um, as it said on one television show, I don't know how to turn on that for the computer. You know, <laughs> get a grandson or granddaughter to help you. These kids know how to do all this stuff, and they'll find it for you. Um, and ask them to show you how to find, you know, where this adoration is. If you can't get out of the house, there is a way to virtually bring adoration into your home. This is something quite remarkable. And... Um, you know, I think I would also seek the intercession of Blessed Acutis. He's, you know, he's not canonized yet, but part of his path to holiness is that he used the Internet to bring Eucharistic miracles to make them available so people could find out about them. Well, now we see another step that wasn't even going on when he was starting off to work in the internet. Namely, that adoration of Christ is able to be brought everywhere in the world and no place could, would be part. If you can't get to church for a variety of reasons, then you can at least, you know, get that one of those apps with Eucharistic adoration. And then, you know, again, bring your Bible. Read over the sacred, the passages that are difficult, and sit and listen to our Lord. And know that even though the Lord might be exposed in some city in Europe, while well, you are all by yourself in some place in Alaska, and you can be in communion with Christ on a spiritual basis. And that would be a real blessing, a real blessing. So that's, that's a good thing to do. And then we have an email from Vivian. Father Mitch, may I ask for a clarification? Yes, you may. I hope I can give it. Um, a clarification regarding what other sacraments are required aside from baptism before a couple can receive the sacrament of matrimony. Okay, to receive the sacrament of matrimony, you should be baptized. Um, how, uh, there's a debate with, among the community whether confirmation is a requirement because one Catholic Church is requiring it for all wedding applications. Vivian. Um, you know, in fact, it is not an absolute requirement. But I don't think it's a good idea to avoid it. I don't know why people would be arguing and say, oh, the priest wants to help me make the sacrament of confirmation available so that I get sealed with the Holy Spirit and strengthened to live out my Christian life? Oh, man, I don't want that. No, Don't be dumb. Seek that gift of confirmation. And you need as much of the Holy Spirit. I would say this. And I, and I say this to you as an audience because I say it to every couple that I either prepare for marriage or I'm counseling in marriage. Marriage is a hard vocation. It's tough. It's tough. But it's a vocation that makes you better people because it's tough. I have one set of difficulties as a priest. You have another set of difficulties as a married couple. We all carry the cross, and the cross is the center of every vocation. 
And just as our Savior said on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, then you need to go and ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit that's being sealed with the Holy Spirit so that you have all the gifts you need. And the only other thing I would add is get to confession a lot, both men and women, that when you are unmarried, you might have one set of sins of the flesh that you need to confess. And some people say, well, I'm married, I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, you have a new set of sins. And if you don't believe me, ask your spouse. He or she will give you a couple of suggestions of what they think you might confess. <laughs> they usually have that. And that's why, you know, I, I have said before, you know, I want men to come to confession. All I ever hear is their wife's version of what they did wrong. I want their side of the story. <laughs> so you know, do make sure that you use con confirmation, but also use confession before you get your, your wedding day, and throughout your marriage, because you'll need that healing and reconciliation on a regular basis. That's some of the stuff. We'll take another break, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. Right, welcome back. We are still doing an email show to kind of catch up with emails. And um, I didn't realize that this email was here, but this is a good one for us to take a look at. Um, uh, Providence, this is from Ed, who asks, Father Pacwa, I've heard you mention recently the church's decree banning slavery back in the 1400s with excommunications attached to it. But why was slavery tolerated and multiple popes' directives ignored for so long by Catholic laity and clergy? I'm thinking in part about the $100 million atonement pledge to slave descendants owned by the Jesuits at Georgetown University in the mid-1800s, Ed. Ed, that is a fantastic question. Now, let me just give a little bit more background. I mentioned uh, in one show how when the Atlantic slave trade had ended, had begun, excuse me, when the Atlantic slave trade had begun in the early 1400s, because the Portuguese had discovered the Canary Islands and the Azores Islands, and they began to enslave the uh, inhabitants of those islands. Pope Martin V, around 15, uh, excuse me, around 1425, condemned it immediately. That condemnation was repeated 11 years later by his successor, Pope Eugene IV, in 1436. It was repeated again in the 14. Uh, 50s by, I think it was 1450s, by Pius II. He wrote something very short, just affirming what Eugene and Martin had, had said. And then it was condemned again by Pope Paul III, even with, with a, one of the best statements ever. The others said, this is wrong, but Pope Paul III thought through more clearly, and he added, People of Africa and America have reason and free will, and you have no right to enslave such people. It was repeated again by Urban VIII, the one who had all the trouble with Galileo. People skip over that. Um, and on and on, every century, Pope Pius VII had uh, you know, tried to insist 
at the Congress of Vienna at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. You know, you must con uh, uh, condemn slavery and all you countries must make it illegal. And not all of them wanted to. Um, again, it was condemned by Pope Gregory the 16th in the 1830s. And see, this was one of the issues with the Jesuits at Georgetown. Pope Gregory was furious with the president of Georgetown for having sold those slaves. Um, and he, he got, really got upset and breaking up families. And so this reparation has been done to their descendants, but they never should have had them. And then finally, it, you know, when slavery ended in the Christian countries, um, after Pope Leo XIII wrote an encyclical uh, asking Brazil to end slavery, they did. There are earlier prohibitions. The bishops of England had, made, had called the king to make slavery illegal in England around the year 1000. And then, before, you know, the Norman invasion. It was also condemned by the Pope in the year 800 when there was one island, Sardinia, that had slaves and told them, set your slaves free. You can't, you're Christians, you can't have slaves. This has been consistent. Now, you ask the question, how did this go on then? If the church has been consistent, and by the way, with the, the uh, ex automatic excommunications, it was stated that you will not be forgiven until you set your slaves free and restore all the property you took from them. That's the way it was. But people listen to that magisterium on slavery just as obediently as we have people listening to the magisterium on abortion today. Keep in mind that the Supreme Court Chief Justice who wrote the Dred Scott decision was a Catholic, Roger Tawney, and he owned slaves. In fact, he left, I think he was a, uh, in the Federalist Party, and when they became anti-slavery, he joined the Democrat Party because they were the pro-slavery party. And that's why he was a Democratic president that appointed him to the Supreme Court, and he helped protect slavery. Now, he was going flat against what the Pope had said, and he was under the excommunications. But he didn't care. He cared more. They said, no, the, the Constitution says we should do this, which it doesn't. The Constitution does not guarantee a right to hold slaves. It doesn't say that. But he's, that's how he interpreted it. And he further added that African people were subhuman and that they needed to be slaves until they become as smart as white people. No, that's baloney. Because it was white people that were buying and selling them. That's not smart. That's sin. And the same thing is true about people today. We still have politicians who, and on the Supreme Court, in Congress, in the administration, all branches of government, who push to commit adult, uh, to come well, that too, but they push to commit abortion just like they used to push for slavery. And it led to a war because they pushed for slavery. When you promote something evil, more evil comes from it. And this is why the church kept condemning slavery. And, but pe people say, well, you know, the, the Pope's over in Rome. He doesn't understand what it's like. We have to run a farm over here, and I need slaves to run it. A, you don't have to run a, a farm on slavery. You can treat people with dignity and pay them a good wage and let them share in the benefits, and they'll probably, if you let them share in the benefits of your farm, 
they may even find a way to work harder so it works better. And you produce more. You treat them with dignity because they're temples of the Holy Spirit. It was undercutting the teaching of Scripture that we are all temples of the Holy Spirit and that applies to children in the womb as much as it does to slaves in Africa or America or to sex slaves all around the world today. And these politicians who fight harder to make sure that abortion stays around, they fight harder for that than they do to make sure that there's enough baby formula for the children already here. They will have to answer for what they did as much as Roger Tawney had to answer for, put, for making slavery something that was nationwide in the Dred Scott decision, and by that instigating a war that led to almost 700,000 deaths. We all have to pay attention to these things. So that's why that was the case. All right, we'll have time for one more um, email. Father Mitch, I'm curious why some parishioners and priests say the St. Michael prayer at the end of Mass. Is it because there's so much evil in society right now? Should I be participating in it? Isn't it good for me to pray more than less? Um, a, uh, this was a prayer, I believe it was composed by Pope Leo XIII, the same one who asked, wrote an encyclical to end slavery in the empire of Brazil. Um, and he suggested, asked that to be said at Mass around the year uh, 1900 because he had a vision of something of grave evil, uh, the, of grave evil coming in the next century. He wanted us to pray for the, you know, through the century for, um, you know, St. Michael to protect us from the forces of evil. And in fact, in the 20th century, atheistic governments and nationalistic and socialistic governments were responsible for killing 305 million people. That's three times as many as people as died in the, uh, the, all the wars up until 1900. That's what atheism did, and he had a vision of it. Also, there were 40 million martyrs out of 75 million in the whole history of the church, more martyrs in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries. So he saw that evil and asked us to pray for St. Michael to hold Satan back. It's a good idea for us to do that. Well, the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, we can bring you this show and all of our other programs only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to bring us, to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay, pay all our bills too. We'll conclude with the St. Michael prayers. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. And do thou protect us from all evil. Amen.